when I come around the corner into my basement and, that, and that's when it hits me. It's go time. And when I'm in that zone, I don't let anything get in my, get in my head. I've always said that the gym is kind of my therapy, and that's where I kind of focus on everything what I'm trying to achieve as far as football goes, and I let loose with everything as far as what I've been through and what I've seen, and I just focus there all my aggression and anger and uh, getting fit. It's a thing that a lot of people don't get to get back and give a second shot, but uh, you know, I, I gotta follow my dreams, I've gotta chase them. And um, I think that's what keeps me going, just that drive. And uh, you know, I'm doing it for a lot of reasons, but uh, I won't stop, so you gotta make it happen. I love team sports, I love camaraderie, I love the atmosphere, I love the outdoors, just between the lines, you know. Um, I love the contact of it. When I'm under those lights, you know, when you hear the fans and stuff like that, it's something I want to get back. It's something that I want to feel again. It's been six years since Daniel Rodriguez's last game under those lights. Six years since his senior season at Stafford, Virginia's Brook Point High School. I mean, I was a good football player. I mean, I played wherever they needed me. I did everything from, you know, backup quarterback, running back. Uh, wide receiver, safety, corner, anywhere the coach needed me. It's just something I was naturally talented at. But as a person, probably, I was probably hard-headed, probably arrogant, you know, just thought things should be handed to me, and so I kind of just took for granted the skills that I possess and never try to capitalize on them. Though Daniel considered an attempt to play football at the collegiate level, all such plans would suddenly be put on hold. Just four days after his high school graduation, Daniel's father, Ray, died of a heart attack. His life would never be the same. When it hit me uh, that he had passed away, it was just like, what do I do now? Like, fun's over, <laughs> it was really what it was. It was just like, this isn't a game anymore. You can't live off, you know, dad's income. You know, you have to do something and man up. And then one day he just took us out to lunch and just sat down and told us, I joined the army. And my mom and I were taken aback. And then we said, OK, well, when are you leaving to boot camp? And he said, in five days. Like his father before him, Daniel enlisted as an infantryman. Within six months of joining the Army, he'd been deployed to Iraq, where he spent a year making patrols outside Baghdad, an assignment that entailed daily run-ins with sniper fire and roadside IEDs. After a little over a year stateside, Daniel was deployed for a second tour, this time in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a whole different story. The mountains were unreal. First off, our base was established at the bottom of three mountains. So, you know, it was just one of those things when I stepped foot out and actually saw where we were at and what we were going through and what we were gonna be facing, it was just like, here we go, they're gonna, you know, they're not gonna let me get out. It'll be an easy ride, I gotta fight my way home this time. Uh, we were the furthest north um, American um, forces uh, in northern Afghanistan on the Pakistan border. Um, mountainous terrain, Hindu Kush mountains, you know, right in Kamdesh, uh, in the Nuristan province. Um, it was just a bad place. I mean, we were a trans we were a route from smuggling into Pakistan into Afghanistan, so we were right there. There was no set mission. There wasn't like, you know, go do this, go do that. We would wait to get attacked. We would get attacked and we'd go out and fight. And I 
Iraq, we had sporadic gunfire, sniper fire, but nothing full suppressed on, Taliban ambush, and just hitting you from all sides, and you're just like, you know, holy crap, this is, this is war. Despite the daily firefights, Daniel and the other soldiers at Combat Outpost Keating found themselves wrestling with ample amounts of free time in tightly confined quarters. My days consisted of <laughs> one hot meal um, and watching repetitive movies over and over again until you get hit. And then at nighttime, you just go pump iron, you know, just go work out. Creativity was pretty much the name of the game. There really wasn't much out there. I mean, what we did with ammo cans filling up with dirt, uh, using body assisted, a lot of CrossFit type workouts. Um, we had some rings out there, doing pull-ups on the rafters. Just anything that we could manage or finagle, that's really how we got our workouts in. Those close quarters fostered deep relationships between all the soldiers. And for Daniel, his friendship with Private First Class Kevin Thompson proved invaluable amidst the trying conditions. Uh, yeah, Thompson was my best friend, man. I mean, we spent every day together. We saw each other every day, every minute. We went to the gym together. Uh, you know, you, you bond, you share a lot of insights and stories from your childhood. So I felt like I had known him. So, you know, when you get close and attached to somebody like that and you're under fire with somebody, you really become a, a brother. As Daniel neared the halfway point of his deployment, he and Thompson began to consider what would follow their time in the service. We were just sitting out there after a firefight, you know, your adrenaline's coming down, and it's just like one of those things, just like, this is it, man. Like, I'm 20, 20, 21 years old. I'm not doing this for the rest of my life, you know? And Thompson was just like, you know, well, you know, I'm not gonna stay in either. He's like, I'm gonna go out and do what I wanna do beforehand. And I was like, you know what, I should never, I should just follow my heart and try to play sports, you know, collegially. I had been getting in really good shape and I was like, you know, I'm gonna walk on, I'm gonna use my GI Bill and try to walk on and play college football. And he's like, do it, man. I was like, no, I really am. He's like, well, don't, you know, don't sit here and blow smoke at me, you know, do it. And I was like, I promise you I'll do it. And uh, so I promised him, we promised each other that we we're gonna follow our dreams and mine was to play college football when I got out and uh, he died a week later. I woke up at like 5 a.m. and just went down and used the computer and like 30 minutes into using the computer, it's like incoming, like just pow, rocket hits, pow, another rocket. So I like put my vest on, you know, the medic is in the medic station where the computer was at, the medics come out, I say, hey, wish me luck, man. You know, just joking around, no idea how bad it was about to become. And, you know, charge my nine mil, just take off. Take off running, I come around the corner, and then the next thing I know is just muzzle flash. All in the mouth, like I'm just looking up and there's just muzzle flash, and I'm like dodging, like just running back and forth. And since we're at the bottom, like, you know, it just looked like popcorn, like just pop, pop popping everywhere, I was getting hit in the leg with rocks from the bullets. And I just kept zigzagging and then I just was like, screw it. I just started shooting my nine mil into the mountains. Anytime I'd see muzzle flash come at me, I mean, all I had was a pistol, but I was shooting back better than nothing. You know, as soon as I get to the top to my fighting position, I just get on the machine gun and Thompson's coming out. We could like, we made eye contact, we're just like, he's like, holy crap, you know. This is real, we're getting hit pretty hard. And he came out around me and he's like pointed RPG rock where some Taliban guys are coming down. I just remember like looking at him, pointing, and then boom, just his knees buckle. I can see his weapon drop, and he's done. I mean, he got hit, he was dead before he hit the ground. He kind of fell right, right by my feet. So I just unloaded, I just started spraying at all those guys. And then once I ran out of ammo, like I ran in, I was like, hey, you know, Thompson's hit. I'm like trying to drag his body in. But I couldn't, I was just getting hit with RPGs. I got shrapnel on my legs, trying to pull his body in. Um, and I got hit again in the neck. And finally, I couldn't even move him. You know, he just couldn't do anything about it. And I mean, couldn't do nothing for him. He was already dead. So it was at that point, it was just survival. It was kill or be killed. So I had to just keep going and keep fighting. We were really overrun, and guys were really coming in. and. You know, you're killing at point blank range and just throwing hand grenades in my own cop. Anything that had a bullet shot out of it, I shot it. 
everything. Claymores were trying to set off. I couldn't get over the fact that they killed my best friend. I didn't give a crap at that point. I didn't care. I didn't care what happened to me. I didn't care. I was going to go out there and fight. And, you know, I just, it wasn't my day. It wasn't my day to go. The Battle of Kamdesh remains one of the bloodiest of Operation Enduring Freedom. 300 Taliban insurgents were involved in the attack, 150 of which were killed by U.S. defenses in a firefight that lasted nearly 18 hours. Of the 60 U.S. soldiers stationed at the combat outpost that day, eight were killed and another 22 wounded. Incoming fire and shrapnel left Daniel with injuries to his neck, shoulder, and both legs. He received medical attention in Afghanistan before finishing the last six months of his tour. For his bravery, Daniel was awarded the Bronze Star for Valor and a Purple Heart. When we come back, Daniel returns home to begin the pursuit of his dream. I, uh pull out, committed myself to settle for nothing than having a helmet on my head again on the sideline for some team. His closest friend called me and said, Daniel was, Daniel's okay. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And then maybe about an hour later, Daniel called and he, I, he just sounded like death. I just, I heard the grieving, you know, in his voice. When he returned home to the U.S., Daniel, like so many veterans, brought the burden of combat home with him. He didn't sleep in his room because it was confined, so he slept on the couch, and um, little noises would set him off. I remember one time we were walking to the park, and a kid was, like, set off a firework, and he just dropped to the ground. And I felt like, for a time period, that the war and everything that happened in Afghanistan kind of stole the joy out of him. And I was concerned because it wasn't, it wasn't the brother that I knew before he left. And then just one day, he, he was just like, I'm gonna do this. I'm, you know, I'm gonna start playing college football. I'm gonna start training for it. So began Daniel's basement workouts and the transition back to civilian life. His first step, to enroll at a local community college. I uh, headed to my class at Germana Community College. I have two classes back to back. Uh, it's a day in life, right? <laughs> 10.59. I am on time, Ms. Crystal. Uh, it was difficult at first. I mean, I hadn't picked up a textbook in six years, and now I'm coming back from two tours, going to the classroom. I pounded it in myself that I was not going to settle for anything less than good grades. Clearly, he's an inspiration, but at the same time, he's a good student. With everything that's going on in his life right now, I'm a little in awe, I must admit. During his time at Germana Community College, Daniel has earned a 3.5 GPA. It's been difficult for the first year, but I've gotten over it. I've gotten a great relationship with my teachers and some friends and stuff like that that I've made. So it's uh, been very helpful. And now it's, I mean, it's an awesome feeling knowing that I'm going to class and, you know, achieving that degree that I've, you know, I've wanted to do. So once I established myself as a student at a community college where I've been, I uh, picked up and started two a days again. My diet completely changed and just full out committed myself to settle for nothing than having a helmet on my head again on the sideline for some team. All right, we are at uh, East Coast Strength and Power. Uh, this is uh, usually my second workout of the day. Uh, very impressed with him uh, for a slot receiver position, which is what he's kind of going for. 
Um, he's going to have to be quick, not necessarily fast on the 40. And he's naturally very, very quick, agile. Uh, hips are very, very explosive. And that's all going to benefit him. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, we had a few sets of monkey bars. And I just got creative with what I could do, how far I could throw myself. And uh, I would just try to see how crazy I could get. And then it turned into a workout. I started seeing my pull-ups improve, my core strength improve. And then I just started doing whole entire routines. <laughs> These are behind the back. Pretty smoke, man. Your shoulders get smoke. You're engaging your core and abs. Burn, man. I think what I do here, as far as what I'm capable of doing, my hand speed, uh, the reaction time that I'm getting, the stamina that I'm putting myself on, uh, the training that I'm doing is going to relate as far as cardio goes. So as far as it relates to putting on pads and being effective on the football field, I definitely think it'll carry over. And I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think that it would help me. Stefan, Barry here, Mace. I was yelling his name when I was running up under fire. <laughs> like, Mace, you know. So he kind of covered me for a little bit. Probably a reason I didn't get killed, really. Um, you know, it's like, I don't know, you know, it just kind of, man, um, you never think that you're going to be affected by, you know, certain things that go on in your lifetime, but, you know, believe it or not, every generation has their war. It hits you. It hits me. You know, just kind of like my my friends are underneath my feet. You know, you're walking on top of heroes. You know, everybody wants to call me a hero, or you know, the guy that we're not. I'm not a hero. You know, the guys that died are heroes. You know, I just I was just doing my job. And when I get to Arlington, it's just like that's where heroes are resting at, and and it sucks that some of them are my friends. This is why I do what I do. This is why. My mentality is the way it is, because it's like, if I fall short of things I set out to do, it's Taliban wins. So everything I do is for these boys. News of Daniel's pursuit began to attract attention from several football programs in the early part of 2012. Subsequent campus visits eventually led to the offer Rodriguez had been dreaming of. Clemson was like, you know, hey, we'll take a shot at you. And so I came down there, met with Coach Dabo. I mean, he's just somebody I want to play for. You know, he's going to give me an opportunity. He's going to give me a shot. I can't, I can't wait. I really can't. So uh, I'm really looking forward to everything and hopefully everything works out because, man, coming down that hill would just be a feeling that I don't, I don't, even, I don't know if words would be able to describe it. I don't ever take my bracelet off. It's got all their names on it the day, the day they were killed. I'm always going to have them with me. So I think that first game, if I get that opportunity to run down that hill at Clemson, man, they're going to be taped up on my wrist. So I'm going to have them out there with me and share it with them. It would be incredible just to know that he's worked so hard and the things that he's had to overcome and to know how much he's put into it. I just, it would be awesome because it's been such, it's been such a long journey for him. 
I know that if it all comes to a crashing end, there's not a moment that I didn't spend in this path, in this journey, that I, that I didn't give it everything I had. I'm not gonna look back 10 years from now and say what if. Like I should, I should have tried. You know, I should have did. I should have tried it. Go out there and play football when I was still young and had fresh legs. No, that's not ever gonna happen to me. I will never look back and say I should have done it. No, I'm gonna do it.